Welcome to chapter 5, the integumentary system. Um, this is the last chapter for your unit 1 exam. Uh, your unit 1 exam will consist of chapters 1 through 5. Um, this is the chapter where we begin, we begin to get into each body system. Uh, we will talk about the structures that comprise each system as well as their functions. So basically the anatomy and the physiology. If you remember from chapter one, an organ system includes um, groups or a collection of organs and structures that come together to serve a common function or common functions. Overall, the integumentary system will include skin, hair, nails, sweat, as well as oil glands. We will talk about each of these structures in greater detail as we move throughout this lecture. The first thing that we will talk about is the skin. Uh, before we get going with that, you should note that the skin is the largest organ of the body and is the primary constituent of the integumentary system. If you remember from chapter four, skin is a cutaneous membrane. A membrane includes two um, at least two primary tissue types. Um, in this case, a cutaneous membrane or skin includes a layer of epithelium, also referred to as the epidermis, and a layer of connective tissue proper, which we will refer to as the dermis. So again, these two distinct regions, we have the more superficial region or closer to the surface, the epidermis, um, but what that actually is, is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Many layers of flat cells that produce keratin. The epidermis is avascular, without blood supply. Deep to the epidermis, we find the dermis. The dermis is going to be connective tissue proper and is highly vascularized. It's going to provide the blood supply to the epidermis via diffusion. And another structure that we talk about um, when we talk about skin, but it is not actually a part of skin, is known as the hypodermis or below the dermis. The majority of the hypodermis is adipose tissue or fat. While it is not a part of skin or those two layers listed above, it contributes to the overall functions. You should be familiar with the image on the slide um, seen in front of you. However, you don't necessarily have to identify every single structure. But what you should take away from this slide is being able to identify the epidermis, the dermis and its two layers that we will talk about, and the hypodermis. All three of these terms are seen on the left side of the image. Let's first talk about the epidermis um, or the more. Again, the epidermis is a stratified epithelium, meaning it has many layers of cells, uh, but we can further break up these many layers and form five or even four layers. Two types of skin are found throughout the body. We have thick skin and thin skin. Thick skin is found on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. Thick skin contains all five of the layers listed below. Thin skin is everywhere else on the body. It's on the back of your hand, it's on the abdomen, the back, the legs, the thighs. Thin skin only contains four of the five layers listed below. These layers are listed in order from deep to superficial. Um, so working your way towards the bottom and towards the surface. So we start with the stratum basale or the basal layer. We have the stratum spinosum, the stratum granulosum, stratum lucidum, and stratum corneum. Note that layer four, the stratum lucidum, is found only in thick skin, again, the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. We will talk a little bit about each layer, um, 
but what you should really know is the order in which they go in either from deep to superficial or vice versa. Stratum basale is the basal layer. Um, it is the deepest of all layers and it is the one that is anchored to the underlying dermis or to the underlying connective tissue proper. The stratum basale is the mitotically active layer, meaning that is where we see cells regenerate. And as they regenerate, they move towards the top or towards the apical surface. The next layer, superficial to the stratum basale, is the stratum spinosum, or the spiny layer. Uh, we call it the stratum spinosum because the primary cell found in the epidermis, the keratinocyte, begins to appear prickly or spiky in this layer. We will also see many filaments uh, forming to resist tension and pulling throughout the skin. Superficial to the stratum spinosum, now we have the stratum granulosum. Each of these layers contains many cell layers. Uh, so overall, we probably have maybe 30, 40, or even 60 layers of cells creating skin or the epidermis. In the stratum granulosum, we begin to see cells flatten or appear like a squamous cell. The nuclei as well as organelles begin to die off and disintegrate. In the stratum granulosum we also see um, the beginning of keratinization. So these cells will accumulate keratin. Uh, keratin is an important protein that will slow water loss but also prevent water from being absorbed into the body through the skin. This is the layer where we also see cells begin to die. As they lose their nucleus and their organelles, um, they are too far from the capillaries or the blood vessels in the dermis to receive any sort of nutrition. Next, remember the stratum lucidum is found only in thick skin, uh, so the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, um, areas of higher abrasion and wear and tear. Um, stratum lucidum, so lucid, think clear. Uh, this is a thin band of a few rows of cells um, that are typically flat and dead. And finally, the most superficial layer of the epidermis is known as the stratum corneum. This layer in particular includes 20 to 30 rows of flat cells um, that do not have their nucleus. Uh, the purpose of this layer is to protect deeper cells, again from abrasion, uh, penetration, wear and tear. Um, this is also the layer that will function as a barrier against many different assaults uh, to the human body. Looking at this slide here, uh, we see a histological section of the epidermis and a very small part of the dermis, but you are able to see um, the four distinct layers. Uh, so this would be a section from thin skin, not thick skin. The deepest layer uh, towards the basal surface is the stratum basale, followed by the stratum spinosum, the stratum granulosum, and the stratum corneum. You will not have to identify these. However, you should have um, an idea of what is characteristic of each layer, uh, but most importantly, the order in which they go in. The dermis uh, is the other part of skin or the cutaneous membrane. The dermis is the connective tissue that underlies the epidermis um, and anchors it. Certain cells that are found throughout the dermis, we are going to have fibroblasts. Remember, immature cells that produce the extracellular matrix in connective tissue proper. We have macrophages, uh, which function as phagocytes to engulf debris. We also have mast and white blood cells uh, for an immune response. The dermis is where we find blood vessels that will supply the epidermis via diffusion. This is where we find our hair follicles and different types of glands. 
Within the dermis, we have two layers. Uh, the papillary layer is more superficial. Papillary means finger-like projection or bump. And we will see that layer look like fingers projecting up into the epidermis. Deep to the papillary layer of the dermis, we find the reticular layer of the dermis. On this slide here, uh, we see the epidermis, which is the more superficial region of skin, uh, followed by the dermis. Uh, you are able to identify the two layers of the dermis, the papillary layer, finger-like projections um, up into the epidermis, followed by the reticular layer. Let's first talk about the papillary layer of the dermis. Remember, the dermis overall is connective tissue proper. In this case, the papillary layer is loose connective tissue or areolar connective tissue. Uh, we see a great deal of phagocytes in this layer, uh, cells that utilize phagocytosis to engulf large debris um, and ultimately digest it. The part of the papillary layer of the dermis that projects up into the epidermis, um, those are known as dermal papilla. Uh, but in those, more specifically, a dermal papilla in thick skin, so the soles of your feet and the palms of your hands, um, they're so great that they create epidermal ridges and ultimately friction ridges. But what I am saying here is that the dermal papilla in thick skin is what gives you your unique fingerprint pattern. If you look at uh, your fingers on the palm side, you do see these ridges, um, but they are also what gives you your fingerprint pattern. Again, the dermis overall um, is uh, made up of connective tissue proper. We saw that the papillary layer was areolar connective tissue or loose connective tissue. The reticular layer now is comprised of dense connective tissue or fibrous connective tissue. Um, so we have a lot of collagen there to provide for strength um, as well as to resist tension and pulling. In the reticular layer is where we have blood vessels and these blood vessels will provide for uh, the overlying epidermis and supply its nutrition. Moving on, we will now address uh, skin color. There are three pigments or three hues or colors that contribute overall. Uh, one of them we did mention, uh, melanin, is going to be produced by melanocytes, which are a primary cell type in the epidermis. Once melanocytes produce melanin, um, they are going to package it into little bubbles known as melanosomes. And the purpose of that whole process is to ultimately protect DNA in keratinocytes from UV radiation. But as you all know, if you sit in the sun, uh, you may get sunburnt or you may develop a more tan color. Um, and that's because sun exposure will stimulate the production of melanin by melanocytes. Carotene uh, is another pigment that contributes. Uh, carotene, you shouldn't think of carrot. So this is a more yellow or orange pigment. Um, and if you think about eating carrots, it's good for your eyes. But carotene in the skin can be converted to vitamin A, which is found in carrots. Um, this is good for vision as well as epidermal health. And lastly, we have hemoglobin. Anything with the prefix heme means blood. Hemoglobin is actually found in the bloodstream. Um, it's going to bind oxygen, and it's mostly made up of iron. But someone who is Caucasian or has more fair skin, you are able to see this hemoglobin show through the skin due to less melanin compared to hemoglobin. Another structure uh, that contributes to the integumentary system and its overall function is hair. Uh, we will talk about the functions of hair, different types of hair, as well as um, the structure of a hair and a hair follicle. 
overall hair is going to be uh, dead keratinized cells. Um, and this is different than the keratin in your skin. Um, the keratin in your skin is more soft, whereas the keratin in your hair has been hardened. Um, usually there is no hair found on the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet, um, amongst other locations on the human body. Overall, hair is going to warn of insects on the skin. Um, so if you feel a mosquito on your arm, it's usually your hair telling your brain and spinal cord or alerting your body of that mosquito. Um, the hair on your head protects against physical trauma. Um, hair helps prevent um, heat loss, uh, and it also will shield the skin from sunlight. Looking at the diagram here, uh, we are able to identify hair follicles, which are found in the dermis or the deeper region of skin. Um, hairs are going to be produced by those follicles. And like I just mentioned, hair is hard keratin uh, compared to the soft keratin in skin. Uh, we have two different regions of hair in general. Uh, the shaft of the hair is everything found above the scalp or above the body. Um, and that is dead keratinized cells. Deep to the shaft, so everything deep to the skin or within the skin rather, is the root. And the root is found within the scalp or within the dermis. And that is where we still have the process of keratinization um, occurring. Overall, the pigment of your hair um, is produced by melanocytes within the hair follicles. There are truly only three hair pigments um, across the human population. Um, you have black, brown, and then blonde. There are two types of hair uh, found across the human body. There's vellus hair and terminal hair. For your exam, you should know where each of them are found um, or a brief description. Vellus hair um, is more common. It's pale, it's fine, um, and it's found along the abdomen, the arms, and the legs. Um, terminal hair is found on your head or on your scalp. Um, terminal hair also comprises your eyebrows, so it's more coarse or typically longer than vellus hair. Um, at puberty, terminal hair will appear um, in the armpit, also known as the axillary region, and also in the pubic region of both male and females. In the next portion of this lecture, uh, we will simply describe um, the structure of nails. Nails, again, contribute to the overall function of the integumentary system. Nails are somewhat similar to the epidermis as well as hair in that they contain keratin. Uh, but more so like hair in that they have hard keratin. Nails, both fingernails and toenails, are going to protect um, the ends of those body regions, and all nails will consist of a free edge, uh, which is the fingernail tip, uh, where dirt usually collects under. The nail plate um, is the part that you paint with polish, um, or if you've bruised your finger, you can see it through the nail plate. And lastly, the root. Uh, the root is the part of the nail that is embedded uh, deep to the skin, kind of towards your cuticle. Lastly, we have the nail bed um, and the nail matrix. The nail bed is the epidermis, so it's a part of the skin. And lastly, the matrix is responsible for growth. So again, that is also deep to your cuticle. Um, you actually cannot see it, it's below the skin. On this slide, uh, you are able to see all the terms that I have just addressed. Again, the free edge is where dirt collects under. Sometimes it's white. We also have the nail plate, um, the nail bed, uh, just a few things that we discussed. The last thing that we will talk about uh, with regards to organs and structures that make up the integumentary system will be sweat and oil glands.
Another name for sweat glands uh, is sudoriferous glands. Um, all skin except for the nipples in both male and female and external genitalia will contain sweat glands. There are two different types of sudoriferous glands. They are ecrine and apocrine. Overall, all sweat glands will contain a special cell type known as a myoepithelial cell. And if you look at the prefix or the first part of that cell name, myo means muscle. These cells are going to be comprised of muscle or smooth muscle rather. Um, and when they contract, they are going to force um, that gland to produce its contents and to force it out onto the body. Looking at the first type of sweat gland, an ecrine sweat gland is um, the more numerous one or the more common one that is really found all throughout the body. Um, its primary function is temperature regulation and its main secretion is sweat. But what sweat actually is is mostly water. Uh, we have some salts in there um, as well as some um, antimicrobial agents like dermocidin. The other type of sweat gland is known as an apocrine sweat gland. Um, apocrine sweat glands are the ones that are found in the axillary or the armpit region, as well as the anogenital area. Um, the way that I remember where apocrine sweat glands are found is that both locations also start with the letter A. Overall, these types of glands don't start functioning until puberty. And when they do, their secretion or their product is that milky or yellowish sweat that will contain fat. And where body odor actually comes from is that bacteria eat or ingest that fat and protein produced in that substance and break it down. Furthermore, uh, while we are on the topic of apocrine sweat glands, we have some modified apocrine glands. Um, these are not found in the axillary or anogenital areas. Um, they are known as ceruminous glands. Ceruminous glands produce cerumen, aka earwax. Uh, so ceruminous glands are found in the external ear canal where you put your Q-tip. Another type of modified apocrine gland is a mammary gland, which will produce and secrete milk from the breast. And another type of gland uh, that belongs to... We will finish up this lecture by talking about uh, the five or six functions of skin. So just talking about the epidermis and the dermis now, we will get into those. With skin being the largest organ, um, it also serves as primarily a barrier and whether that is to the air outside or potential harm um, or even chemicals, the skin is going to protect what's on the inside of us from what is outside of us and vice versa. Other functions of skin, we have protection, um, thermoregulation, cutaneous sensation, uh, we have some metabolic functions, skin serves as a blood reservoir and is also responsible for waste excretion, like sweat. When we look at skin as a barrier um, and the fact that it serves protection from many different factors, um, we could see that it protects the body from chemicals, uh, physical assaults, as well as biological factors. Um, but if you think about everything that our skin is subjected to every single day, um, this function is extremely important. First, uh, skin is a barrier against chemical substances. Um, if you put together all of the things that skin produces and secretes, um, it reduces the amount of bacteria that we are involved in. Um, it also contributes to this idea of the acid mantle, meaning that 
our skin has a relatively low pH um, or acid base balance and that is great to slow down the multiplication of bacteria or even the growth. You could also think about the melanin that is produced by melanocytes um, which will protect the DNA in our skin from UV radiation. In addition to a chemical barrier, uh, skin also serves as a physical barrier. Again, the epidermis is many layers of dead and flat cells uh, that will block water as well as water-soluble substances. And then lastly, a biological barrier. Uh, so we have many different types of phagocytic cells as well as macrophages. Both of them are going to engulf debris, um, digest it, or even bring that foreign debris or material to the immune system so it can take care of it further. Skin also functions in uh, temperature regulation or thermoregulation. Um, if you think about sweat, uh, so sweat glands are constantly working, but they do go into overdrive in response to um, increased temperatures about 80 8 to 90 degrees, um, and once that sweat evaporates off of the skin, it dissipates heat, um, which will cool the body down. On the other side of things, if it's pretty cold outside, um, our skin will drop to that level to reduce passive heat loss, and it will also stimulate shivering. In the epidermis and dermis, we have many different types of receptors that will respond to uh, stimuli in the external environment. Something as simple as touching your car keys or grabbing a hot cup of coffee. Um, because of these cutaneous receptors, we are able to detect those stimuli in the skin. Skin is a blood reservoir, meaning it is able to store or hold some of the body's total blood volume. Um, and vice versa, the vessels in the dermis can constrict or shunt blood elsewhere, like to working organs during exercise. And lastly, uh, we see skin function in the excretion of wastes, like nitrogenous wastes, um, ammonia. We also see skin um, secrete salt as well as water in the form of sweat.